sample case study. This is literally what the screen would look like for your students when they graduate. Let's take a look at the anatomy of the screen real quick over where I put the number one case study screen one of six. What does that do? It is alerting candidates that, hey, this is a case study now. And it's kind of a you are here because you can imagine as they progress through the case study, uh, eventually they'll see things like screen five of six, right? So they, they'll always know where they are. On the left hand side, we've got a lot of stuff, but let's start where I put the number two. There's just a one sentence lead in. It kind of sets the table, right? Maybe it says the setting or um, gives a very brief description of the client. Okay, three, four, five, six, go together a little bit. I bet most of you, if not all, are familiar with what we call the exhibit item type on the NCLEX today. Well, this is kind of a carryover from that. Our case studies use a tabbed format to present information to the test taker. So here we go. Is it always four tabs? No. In fact, you're going to see one. I'm going to show it to you in the one we do together that starts with only one tab, right? Well, if it starts with four tabs, is it four tabs the whole time? Not necessarily. A fifth tab could be added partway through the case study. So there's nothing sacred about the number of tabs. The point is we use a tabbed format to provide a lot of information about the client. So let's go over to the other side of the screen and that's where we put the question or in my business, we say the item. With that, uh, I wanna emphasize, your graduates will always have access to the entire screen. They will have access to all the tabs, no matter what item they're on. Uh, for the benefit of our eyes, especially mine, needing to read the small print, um, I am going to be focusing on half the screen at a time. That, uh, trust, trust me with my vision, <laughs> you wouldn't want it any other way. So the other thing I'm gonna do, because I know some of you join on your phone, and some of you may even be driving. I sure don't want you to read this while you drive. I am going to read all of this to you. Uh, and I may mispronounce a few specialty terms, but let's go. The nurse is caring for a 17-year-old male client who reports a recent injury to the left thoracic cage. History and physical tab. Client reports injuring his left ribs after being struck by a mechanically pitched baseball in a batting cage last week. He has significant bruising, feels lightheaded. Also reports intermittent pain in the left shoulder, denies shortness breath, has some discomfort in the lower left, pardon me, the left lower chest when taking a deep breath. Reports feeling abdominal fullness, occasionally nauseous. No significant past medical history. Surgical history includes orthoscopic repair to the left shoulder for a torn rotator cuff last year. Has not felt well enough to attend baseball practice since the injury. Well, that was a lot of information, but guess what? There's more. Nurses notes. Let's go. Patient appears pale, slightly diaphoretic, large amount of bruising noted along the left torso and over the LUQ of the abdomen. Patient is guarded. There's tenderness upon palpation, dullness to percussion over the abdomen, slightly diminished breath sounds on the left, productive cough noted, ECG shows normal sinus rhythm, and there's more vital signs. BP, 90 over 50, pulse 116, respirations 24, temperature 97.8 or 36.6 for our Canadian friends, and oxygen 98% on room air. Almost there. Lab results. Hemoglobin, uh, 9. Hematocrit, 27%. White blood cell count, 19,000. Uh, I want to indicate here, you may see on your screen if you're not driving, Reference ranges, that's a little bit new because you probably know today candidates are expected to have memorized reference or normal ranges for various lab values. Well, one of the things we're doing with Next Generation, we are trying to be more authentic, right? Well, more authentic is if 99.9% .9 of the time when a lab result comes, the reference range is printed right next to it. Well, we are going to provide it in the name of authenticity. So. Uh, that may be good news for students and educators. All right, let's keep going. We can finally come to the question. So you probably noticed, it took me a while to read all that. Definitely, right? Um, and that's a good thing because I, I think sometimes if you just skim it, you lose sight of just how much information there is, right? It's a lot of information. And what are we trying to do? Well, when the nurse educators like yourself come in and write these scenarios, we say to them, we want realistic, right? Which can include 
things that aren't even super important, like maybe the baseball mechanically pitched. Do we need to know that? I don't know, right? Um, but that's real world. You get all of this information. Uh, I think studies show that a nurse walking into the room may encounter thousands of cues. Some of them might be pretty irrelevant, like the color of the wall or the carpet, right? Um, but some of them might be entries in nurses' notes or a particular lab value that isn't particularly exciting at the moment, right? Well, somehow, because we know the nurse cannot respond to all thousand plus at the same time, somehow the nurse has to be able to say, which are the most salient? Where do I start? What are the things that really jump out here, right? It can't be everything. So let's take a look in that spirit at the first item. Drag the assessment findings that require immediate follow-up to the box on the right. So again, the test taker still has all those tabs on the other side of their screen. We don't, because I wanted it to be bigger, that's all. Um, but anyways, what kind of item type is this? Today on the NCLEX, we use a format called drag and drop. Well, this is also drag and drop, but it simply has more choices. So we call it extended drag and drop. That's gonna be a theme you'll see. I mentioned that the item types we have today weren't really sufficient for a strong measurement of clinical judgment. In some cases, if we just added more choices or put a little twist, it sort of got over the hump. So you'll see some item types from me that are extensions of existing item types, but you'll also see some that are brand new. Okay, so here's extended drag and drop. What's going on? Drag the assessment findings that require immediate follow-up to the box on the right, and we see things like productive cough, uh, the, the blood pressure. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. Okay, it looks like I, I was temporarily muted, so I will I will go back into it. Drag the assessment findings that require immediate follow-up to the box on the right, productive cough, some vital signs, intermediate left shoulder pain, et cetera. So in terms of that clinical judgment measurement model, what is really going on here? Well, that first box at layer three we call recognize cues. It is all about here is a lot of information including information you probably don't need. Well, what are the things you really need to pay attention to right now, right? Can you distinguish relevant from irrelevant? Can you distinguish now from later? Can you distinguish critical from good to know, but not critical? These kinds of things. You may notice we didn't ask, what do they mean? Why are they important? And it's not because we don't care or we don't consider that critical judgment. It's simply because that's the second box, not the first. So in the first box, it's about recognizing or identifying these cues. When we get to the second item, it's a little more about interpreting or analyzing. So let's take a look at the second item in the set. And again, the test taker has all that information available on the other side of the screen. Nurses reviewing the client's health history and medical record drag each potential issue that the client is at risk for to the box on the right. Well, I bet you recognize the item type because it's the same as the one before it. We call it extended drag and drop still. Um, okay, well, what's going on here? We have identified or recognized the very salient cues that require the attention of that nurse, right? But now it's a little bit more about what could they mean? How do they connect together? right? How does the puzzle sort of fit together when we see these cues? Uh, that's what's going on here in our model. We call it analyze cues. So it's a little bit more at the meaning or connections among those various cues. Okay, we are now uh, approaching halftime in the case study. We've made it to item three, and we see an item that does look quite different from anything on today's exam. The nurse is initiating the client's plan of care, complete the following sentence by using the list of options. And we see here, the nurse should first address the clients and we have this pull down menu with three choices like abdominal pain, respiratory status, and lab test results followed by the clients. And then guess what? The second menu is actually the same as the first. So I'm showing you one, uh, one open, I guess, and one closed, uh, but anyways, uh, so it's essentially what should we do first? What should we do next? This item type, uh, formally, right, for testing professionals, we would call it a close pull down menu, and that's close with a Z because it's a German term. Um, but 
Um, I'm happy enough just to call it pull down menu. That's what it looks like. And I think you'll be okay calling it that. So it's a pull down menu item. But what about in terms of the clinical judgment measurement model? Well, clearly the nurse here is prioritizing. And our third box is all about prioritize. Our full name is prioritize hypotheses. But I want to emphasize for this group that things can come in two different flavors. Sometimes we're prioritizing hypotheses oh, what's most likely happening here, for example. Um, but sometimes we're, I call it prioritizing conditions. If you read this first sentence, evaluating and ranking hypotheses or conditions according to priority. Well, if we go back to the previous item, we can see we're kind of prioritizing conditions or aspects of the client situation. It may feel more like that than hypotheses. So uh, again, two flavors. What unites the two? Prioritization is always step three. We're prioritizing. Okay, we now get to the second half. Now a little, I'll call it a teaching tip. You, it's unofficial. You can take it if you like it. You can discard it if, if it's just too much information. I think of a case study as having two halves. The first half of the case study is the thinking half. Okay, wow, look at all this. What's going on? That kind of thing. The second half is a little more action oriented or intervention oriented. It's more the doing half. So there's a thinking half and a doing half. But of course, even in the doing half, we're still thinking, right? Because it's clinical judgment, clinical decision-making, right? You can't, you can't do clinical judgment without some thinking. But the point is we sort of transition into the, what are we gonna do about it phase of the case. So here we are with the fourth item. The nurse is speaking with the physician regarding the treatment plan for the client who was just diagnosed with a splenic laceration and left-sided hemothorax. So tip for educators, sometimes candidates feel like they can skip the directions, right? The directions are just fluff, extra reading, waste of time. Well, gosh, we just put the diagnoses here. So um, discourage skipping, uh, skipping the reading. Uh, we try not to waste their time with super long directions, but if we put something, uh, it is worth reading, I would say. Okay, now let's get to what do we do. For each potential order, click to specify whether the potential order is anticipated or contraindicated for the client. Well, gosh, we can see here an item type that is not on today's NCLEX. It is brand new for the next generation NCLEX. We call it a matrix or a grid. It's where you put your answers into rows and columns. So uh, simple enough if we just take it one row at a time, potential order, echocardiogram. Well, would we anticipate that or would we see that as contraindicated? Okay, how about IV fluids? How about abdominal ultrasound? preparation for surgery, serum type, screen, et cetera. Okay, so I think you get how the item works. What's going on? Well, it's all about thinking about the client needs and asking ourselves as the nurse, what kinds of things might help, but also what kinds of things wouldn't help and might even make things worse, right? So in our clinical judgment measurement model, we're on the fourth box out of six at layer three, we call it generate solutions. And what I showed you, I think is a really nice example of that. It's all about thinking about what we're hoping to accomplish, what the goals might be, and, and what, uh, what ingredients in the plan of care might get us there. It doesn't mean we're going to or that we can do every single one of them, uh, but it just means, hey, these, these things at least are worth considering. And oh, by the way, here are some things we probably should avoid. Okay. Uh, we haven't yet decided exactly what we're going to do. Short story, when we started doing our writing and review panels for the next generation NCLEX, we had very experienced educators and very experienced clinicians, and they'd read the scenario, and without even looking at any of the, uh, the questions, right, they'd say, oh, I know exactly what we need to do. We need, we, need, we need to request an order for, you know, an IV of whatever and do this and prepare for surgery, and, and that is experienced nursing in action. Right, um, but how did our participants know these things? Well, ultimately there was evidence in the case, in the scenario, right? There were cues that they recognized, analyzed. They had uh, hypotheses or conditions that they prioritized. They, they uh, instead of having to make a long list of possible interventions, kind of jumped to the right one, but you get the idea. It sort of sped up our process because with experience, that's what happens. Uh, okay. Let's go to the fifth item in the set. 
the nurse has been asked to prepare the client for immediate surgery. Okay, so we're a little closer to exactly what we're gonna do here. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? You all recognize this item type. It's essentially a select all that apply. Uh, in my, in my uh, world, we call it multiple response, but you can see that there are extra answer choices. Therefore, I call it extended multiple response. If you like, you could call it extended select all that apply, right? It's the item type we use today, but with more options. So what's happening here? Well, we're very focused on what to do. That is our fifth box, which is take action. Again, for this group, I wanna emphasize two flavors of take action, right? Educators always tell me, Jason, we'd rather you be comprehensive, even if it's a little confusing, then leave out information we need to know just to keep it simple. So here I am, I'm gonna be complicated um, because I think ultimately you want this information. So there are two flavors of take action. The first flavor is kind of like what you see here. It's basically, what are we gonna do, right? It's a what or a which sort of question. The second flavor of take action is a how. How are we gonna do this? Now, educators uh, are quick to tell me that how questions really are often memorized procedures. The textbook already says how to do it. First, you wash your hands, then you open the box facing a certain way, then you take out glove number one, right? There's, there's you know, uh, tried and true step-by-step -step processes that students memorize. However, on the next generation NCLEX, in a case study, if there is a how, it means there is something non-routine here, a little bit of a curveball to keep with the mechanically pitched uh, baseball analogy here. Um, what do I mean by that? So pretend that somewhere in the scenario, there are cues that suggest the client may have difficulty swallowing, but pretend that they need a medication that's usually administered orally. Well, the how isn't just give them the pill and tell them to swallow it, right? It get, it's a little different. I don't want to pretend that's a super hard challenge for, for nurses, but, uh, but you get the idea. If there's a how, it connects definitely to information in the scenario. When we hold our item review panels, if there's a how, we say, hey, tell us if this is a memorized procedure, then we don't want it, right? We want to make sure that the how involves clinical judgment. Ready for the sixth and final item in the case study. Pay careful attention because you are gonna be writing some of these with me, believe it or not, in just, uh, I think in just a few minutes. Uh, so here we go. Final item in the set, click to highlight the findings below that would indicate the client is not progressing as expected. And the way this works, just like it says, is I can click on something and it highlights. I can click on something else and it highlights. I can click again and it unhighlights if I change my mind. But the point is, uh, we are literally highlighting good news. The student, the graduate, the test taker doesn't have to spend any mental energy deciding, do I just say refusing to use the spirometer? Do I need to include stating it causes pain? Do I say the client is? No, we have pre-programmed these. If they click on any part of the correct response or, or even the incorrect response, if they click on any part, they get the whole thing. So they don't, they don't have to decide word by word. They just need the, the basic concept here. Okay, well, what's going on? The name of this item probably won't shock you. We call it a highlighting item. Uh, in terms of the clinical judgment measurement model, this is all about evaluation in the nursing process or in our model, we say evaluate outcomes, right? Um, so typical evaluate outcomes is we essentially have a before and after of our client. The before is kind of when we first showed up as the nurse. The after is after some interventions have been performed. Well, we had a bunch of findings before. We get some new findings after, right? And we need to be able to recognize, okay, are all these good news? Are any of them bad news? Do some of them indicate that an intervention might have been ineffective? Do some of them indicate maybe I should have done something else, right? So evaluate outcomes is how all of these finish. So congratulate yourselves. You've made it through um, the absolute uh, most dense part of this presentation, which is to get through an entire case study, not just to look at the questions, but to connect them with the clinical judgment measurement model, right? We got to connect those dots. So key features of the case study, real world situations, 
We require that of our item writers, educators, just like you. Give us real world. Okay. Well, that always includes some information that the candidate will not need, right? But that's real world. Real world, nobody ever says to you as the nurse, here are the only three things you need to know. Uh, now, now you know what to do, right? Well, real world, you've got the notes from the prior nurse. You've got you know, any sort of visual or physical assessment that you've done. You might have vital signs, hopefully, right? Lab results, et cetera. You have all this information. Some of it you don't need right now. Uh, that's real life. Okay, two progressions. One, a progression through time. This isn't just a snapshot of the client right now. I mentioned a before and after in some case studies. In fact, there, there's one I presented a couple of weeks ago where we followed the client around for three weeks because they came back after two weeks for some sort of checkup or something like that. But the point is, um, we are following the client through some significant amount of time where uh, they walk in one way or are brought in one way. Interventions happen. Uh, they now uh, are a little bit different, right? So this takes time. But also, it was a progression in terms of our layer three of the clinical judgment measurement model. Um, here's what I want you to know. Here's an important takeaway. You may have just looked at this case study and said, oh boy, some of these items are a little bit complicated. I'm not going to differ with you, right? And clinical judgment in some sense almost requires complicated situations. However, what I don't want you to walk away with is, oh wow, the case study is a whole bunch of random complicated questions. Yikes. Don't think that. It is always six questions. They are always in the six, uh, they were always in the order of those six boxes, starting with recognized cues, finishing with evaluate outcomes, right? Um, so not random at all, right? The first question always is, here's a lot of information. Pick out the things that matter right now, right? Um, it may be worded different, but essentially that's it. The second question is always, okay, why do we care? Or how do these things fit together? What do they mean, right? Some level of analysis. So definitely not random. Those six boxes in order are the blueprint for every single case study on the exam. What else? Well, you saw this, a range of content knowledge. To do well in that case study, to do really well, you would need to know a lot of different things, right? In a multiple choice item, you might get lucky and know the one thing that's needed. But in this case, uh, to do really well, you'd know, need to know a lot of different things. Um, you saw some new item types. And again, they came in two flavors. Some were just extensions of item types we already have, such as extended multiple response and extended drag and drop. Others were genuinely new item types for this exam. You saw the pull down menu, you saw highlighting, and you saw matrix or grid. So here we go. We are going to try one together. If you have already downloaded our spring 2020 newsletter, Turn it upside down because the answers are in the newsletter. I have taken the sample from that newsletter and turned it into an interactive exercise. You will be using the chat, which by the way, I can see is super active. I'm gonna to get to these questions, I hope, all at the end. Uh, but for now, we're also gonna use the chat to complete uh, this item set in a nice interactive manner. Feel free if, if Zoom lets you uh, to like or comment on other people's ideas, or if not, uh, just use the chat for your own ideas. Uh, okay, let's go into it. Uh, so we have a new scenario. Again, in case you're driving or on a small screen, I will read it. The nurse is caring for a 78-year-old female in the emergency department, and there's only one tab. I mentioned before, we had four tabs. That's not a magic number. Could just be one. Okay. Client was brought to the ED by her daughter due to increased shortness of breath. You're probably thinking COVID already. Uh, this was written even before the pandemic. So anyway, but okay, increased shortness of breath this morning. Daughter reports the client has been running a fever for the past few days and has started to cough up greenish colored mucus and to complain of soreness throughout her body. Client recently hospitalized for issues with AFib six days ago. Client has a history of hypertension. Vitals are 101.1. Uh, 92 pulse, 22 respirations, blood pressure 152 over 86. Pulse ox, 94, uh, with two liters per minute via nasal cannula. Upon assessment, breathing appears slightly labored. Coarse crackles noted in bilateral lung bases. Uh, skin slightly cool to touch, pale pink in tone. Pulse plus three and irregular. Cap refill, three seconds. Client alert, oriented to person, place, and time. The client's daughter states, sometimes it seems like my mother is confused. So that's our information. 
Now, let's write, recognize Q's item together. Rather than giving you a blank sheet of paper, and by the way, I have a training, we call it our action model training, but it's a long training. It's roughly a half day training, which I'm always willing to do. But the point is, I don't have a half a day for you right, uh, right in this one. So rather than start you with a blank sheet of paper, <coughs> pardon me, we are gonna start with an item mostly written and we are going to essentially fill in the blanks. So we got all that information about the 78 year old female, drag the top four client findings that would require follow up to the box on the right. So we see an extended drag and drop and let's now think like an item writer since that's what we're doing, right? Uh, less like a nurse, less like an educator, more like an item writer. Well, we can tell the logic of this item is that we need four correct answers and two that are incorrect. So we are going to use the chat here. Um, you tell me, uh, type in, uh, just give me one for now, productive cough. Okay, uh, Dr. Gina is already on it, fever. Oh my gosh, you guys get the drill. I didn't even finish my direction, but no, you got it. Tell me something, anything in the findings, anything in the scenario that you believe requires immediate follow-up. We're focusing only on correct ones right now. Okay, yeah, I am seeing all kinds of things, greenish sputum, confused, crackles, uh, yes, okay. This is, this is an amazing group. This, this group just set a record. Uh, oxygen saturation, love it. Okay, now take a quick break. We're gonna make a quick shift. We need our item to have wrong answers. In other words, if I just took six things that you told me, that would be a weird item because it says grab the top four, but we, we don't want them all to be uh, tied for first. So now find some things in the scenario that don't require follow-up. Do I have some information here that doesn't require follow-up? And be careful, we prefer for it not to be too obvious, right? Um, example, let me see if I see something here. Yeah, alert to person, place, and time may be a little bit too obvious, right? That just sounds great. Or if it ever said, you know, breathing is normal, that might not be a great answer choice because it's too obvious. But what am I saying? Cap refill, uh, soreness, um, yeah, alert oriented. I am seeing terrific things, history of hypertension, beautiful. This group gets it. Okay, here comes the big reveal, but I need to emphasize, when I show you what the item writer came up with, it doesn't mean it's better than yours, right? It definitely doesn't mean it's better. It might be different, although what you're gonna see is that a lot of what you suggested, in fact, is what the item writer went with. So fans of Family Feud in the audience, depending on your age, I'm either Steve Harvey without the funny jokes or Richard Dawson without the kisses. Uh, I am now gonna reveal, uh, survey says, <laughs> and here's what we got. Vital signs, lung sounds, cap refill, orientation, radial pulse characteristics, and cough characteristics. That's what the item writer chose. Now, let me emphasize, in case you write one of these yourself ever, right? Um, the way to approach the item logically, I believe, is to write the four right answers and then write the two wrong answers, right? You know, think logically, right? Break it down into the two parts. We need some keys and we need some distractors in testing language. However, don't list in your final form, don't list them in that order or everyone starts to figure out, oh, the, the first ones are right, the last ones are wrong, right? You don't wanna do that. So we like to shuffle them and you can kind of tell looking at the choices here, we've shuffled them from shortest to longest, right? So the correct ones could be anywhere, the incorrect ones could be anywhere. Great job, this group. Guess what though? I have five more and some of them are even a little bit more complicated. This one is a really cool item type. It's a use of our matrix grid in a little bit of a novel way. Let me move things over so I can see the whole thing. Um, well, here's what it says. For each client finding below, click to specify if the finding is consistent with the disease process of, and I've covered up um, what the item writer went with, but they've listed three conditions, right? Three conditions. And so we're gonna put our focus there first. Um, so in the chat box, Tell me some conditions. It doesn't mean the client definitely has this, right? And we know that's that's not the role of the nurse anyways. But what are some things where at least some of the cues might have something in common with, with the condition you type in? I'm seeing pneumonia. I love it. Uh, okay, I'm seeing a lot of pneumonia. What else do I have? I have CHF. I will be honest and say I'm not sure what that is, but I'll take it. Um, okay, sepsis. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, aspiration. Okay, so I'm seeing quite a few things. Um, looks like septicemia, if I'm reading that right. Plenty of pneumonia. I think pneumonia is really jumping off the page for this group. Uh, and I think the item writer went with that as well. So let me reveal. Uh, oh, COPD. Okay, RSV. Right. These days I might say COVID. Um, but let's see what the item writer went with. Uh, pneumonia, UTI, and influenza. Ah, congestive heart failure. Okay, that's important for me to know. Thank you, Brandy. Okay, so uh, that's half the item is, is these headings, right? What are some diseases or illnesses that would be interesting to consider against the client findings, right? Um, well, what are some client findings that would be interested to bounce up against these uh, conditions, right? So. Uh, here it's a little bit of a free for all, but uh, because we've got five things and there's sort of the notion of a key or distractor is a little different than usual because you're probably going to find something that ends up being right for, let's say, two of these conditions and not right for one. So things are a little blurrier here. But what are some findings where it would be interesting? You'd want to know do my students connect this symptom or finding with pneumonia? Do they connect it with UTI? right? It doesn't have to go with all three. It doesn't even have to go with any, but what's interesting, fever, cough, abnormal breath sounds, pneumonia. Yeah, okay, go with pneumonia. Body aches, elevated temperature, labored breathing. Okay, this group is doing a great job. Abnormal sputum. Okay, I like it. Uh, sat, I'm guessing the oxygen. Oxygen. Okay, uh, good. Let's see what the item writer came up with here. Okay, UTI would be good for fever and confusion. Excellent. Confusion would be a great choice. Fever would be a great choice, and we'd probably check off all three, uh, all three illnesses. So let's see what the item writer did. Um, much of what you've mentioned, I think, fever, confusion, soreness, cough and sputum, shortness of breath. Beautiful. I think you all pretty much wrote the same item in a way. Um, so this is nice. Nothing magic, by the way, about the number of rows. If you said, oh, gosh, I had a sixth client finding I really, really wanted, hey, great, add it, add it to the list, it's okay, right? Or if you said, gosh, this is a really great question to ask for pneumonia and UTI, but it's not a good question for influenza, that's okay, get rid of influenza, you know what I'm saying? So these templates that I'm showing you, right, at NCSBN, we've released some sample items to the public, like in the newsletter, June 2020 newsletter, you're getting this full set, right? The point is, rather than start from a blank page with my action model training, um, you can take these items and modify them for a new scenario, and you don't have to start from scratch. You can say, I like this item type. Now let me change it to fit what I've got. Okay, let's go to prioritize hypotheses. So same client, highest risk for developing what? And then it says, as evidenced by the clients, something else. So let's break it down like an item writer. Let's think logically. When it says the client is at highest risk for developing something, well, we need a key in the pull down menu and we need distractors. So let's go in order. Uh, what do you think the client is at highest risk for developing? And spoiler alert, different groups, uh, most groups, have, have a few answers. I, I would say there's a little bit of disagreement here. So don't worry, don't be scared to type in your idea. Uh, we do get disagreement here, which makes me want to talk to my team and see uh, what they thought it was. But at any rate, okay, sepsis, pneumonia. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, sepsis and pneumonia. Uh, okay, great. So now, what are some things that the client is not at highest risk for developing. Maybe they're at no risk or they're at very low risk based on this information. Let's get some distractors. Okay, uh, Deborah, I apologize, respiratory failure. I don't know if that was a key or distractor, but I like it as a choice either way. I'm seeing ARDS from Dr. Gina. Anything else as a distractor? What is the client not at risk for, or at least at much lower risk of? Let's see if we can get two more. Okay, love it. Here we go. Diabetes. Uh, okay, low risk of UTI, hypertensive emergency. Love it. Excellent job. Let's see what the item writer did before we go to the second menu. The item writer went with hypoxia, stroke, dysrhythmias, and pulmonary embolism. Okay. Um, as evidenced by, now again, this is thinking like an item writer. Be careful here. 
Well, obviously we are looking for evidence, right? We think they're at highest risk for a pulmonary embolism because of X, right? Uh, or maybe it's not pulmonary embolism, but whatever it is, right? We're looking for evidence. However, pretend the answer here were, were pulmonary embolism. Uh, as a non-nurse, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, pretend it's pulmonary embolism. If all of the findings we list um, really point hard to pulmonary embolism and don't point at all to anything else, you have now given a big hint, right? When candidates or students open that second menu, and let's say every single thing has to do with like blood clots or something, right? Uh, they're going to say, oh, maybe I better change my answer. I thought it was dysrhythmias, but now that I'm looking at the second menu, I bet they want me to say pulmonary embolism. So the point is, as you list your evidence, obviously you need something to be the right answer, but you don't want everything to point to one place, right? You don't want to give hints, or we call that cueing in the testing world. So uh, let's do it. Whatever condition you thought they were at highest risk for, um, what's, what's some evidence for that? What's some evidence from the case uh, that made you believe they were at that highest risk? Okay, fever. Okay. All right, what else? Uh, anything besides uh, fever here as I'm watching the chat? Okay, the respiratory rate, excellent. And then the way we would fill out the rest of the menu then is with evidence that perhaps points to something else, right? Maybe one of the other things on the list. Okay, well, I'm seeing a lot of things come in. I think you get the idea. The item writer, and I'm, I'm happy to show this because I like what they've done here. The item writer has collapsed a whole bunch of the findings into these larger umbrella headings, vitals, neurologic, respiratory, cardiovascular. That's kind of a clever way to write the item. I would almost put that menu in my back pocket, right? And use that a lot, um, right? It's not about, I don't have to pick out one little thing, but also sometimes when you think about it, um, there might've been many things related to respiration that support your uh, highest risk, right? And so if you just list one of them, maybe that's not enough. Maybe it's important for students or our test takers to recognize, well, it wasn't just this one thing about respiratory, it was kind of all of them taken together. So, okay, well done. We get to the fourth interactive item in the set. Uh, the nurse has reviewed the nurse's notes entries from uh, 10 a.m. and noon, we'll say, and is planning care for the client. For each potential intervention, click to specify whether it's indicated or contraindicated for the care of the client. Perfect. Okay, so this is a little bit like the, the one we saw before, but I want to call your attention to the fact that new information has shown up on this tab, and it's at noon. Noon. Uh, so two hours later, called to bedside by the daughter who states her mother isn't acting right. Upon assessment, client difficult to arouse, pale, diaphoretic in appearance. The vitals are a little different here, 101.5. Uh, pulse, uh, maybe a lot different, 112. Respirations, ooh, 32. Blood pressures dropped a bit there, 90 over 62. Pulse ox down 91% uh, on the same two liters. So things have changed, right? We've got a before and after. We haven't really done our interventions yet, uh, but it's time to think about what kind of interventions might help in this case. So let's write the item this way. Tell me some interventions that you think could help this person based on the new information we see at noon, but certainly factoring in what it looked like at 10 o'clock. Okay, a, a sit-up position. Perfect, Christina. IV fluids. Okay, perfect, Valerie. Uh, okay, fluids again. Good. Dr. Gina, increase oxygen. Love it. I think we're going to see that. Um, okay, uh, antibiotics I'm seeing, uh, increasing the head of the bed. Fabulous. Okay, this, this group is, is setting a record for the most uh, suggestions. And I, as, as a non-nurse, I can't say all wonderful, but I suspect uh, all or nearly all wonderful. Uh, great. Now, thinking like an item writer, let's have some distractors. So tell me some things that would be contraindicated for this particular client. We don't want to be too obvious. Like I'm, I'm sure nobody would choose discharge the patient immediately, right? That's probably a silly one. We wouldn't include it. But what are some things that maybe some of your students who didn't pay attention uh, during parts of the year uh, might go with, right? But really they're contraindicated. What are some things we wouldn't do? Uh, pain meds, mm, yeah. Uh, prepare for chest tubes, 
okay. Uh, increase activity, okay. Sit them up in a chair, ambulate, love it. Let's take a look. Survey says, okay, prepare for defibrillation, place client in a semi fowlers. I think I saw that from, from a few of you. Uh, requ uh, request in order to increase oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, the IV, yeah, okay. And uh, inserting peripheral, uh, peripheral VAD, right? So these are the choices. Some are keys, some are distractors, right? But you get the idea. It's about thinking about what kinds of things would help, what kinds of things would not be appropriate. Let's go to this next one. Take action. The nurse has received orders from the physician. Click to highlight the three orders that the nurse should perform right away. So you get the idea. The physician uh, has listed five things, right? Well, we can't do them all at once, right? I don't even know if we can do three things at once. Is that possible? Well, nurses are capable of miracles, I suppose. Um, so the way we're going to write this item is I need you to anticipate three orders that would have some urgency. What are three things that could come from the physician that we would want to do right away, ASAP? Um, okay, go ahead and use the chat. And I see questions coming in for me. I'll do my best at the end to jump in and try to grab those. Anything I don't get live today, I'll do my best to answer by email if I can. Okay, uh, more oxygen, chest x-ray, order labs. Yeah, uh, you're right, oxygen, blood cultures, antibiotics, start the IV, uh, sepsis workup, fluids, this group is awesome. Okay, uh, now shifting gears. What are some orders we can anticipate that don't need to be done right away? Maybe it's a, you know, you could wait till tomorrow on this one or, you know, come back later for this one. Uh, you could even list something that the nurse might be right to question, right? But the point is, we've got five things on the list we can tell. So we need two that aren't the right answer. Okay, I'm seeing echocardiogram, physical therapy, MRI. You get the idea. Okay, I think OT, occupational therapy, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, now, item writing trick, right, from Jason here. Um, pretend that you came, you, you were trying to do this, and you said, gosh, here are four things that need to be done right away, and here are three things that don't. Well, that's okay. That's a good item, too. You could list four things that need to be done right away and three things that don't. We would just change the, the intro and say, click to highlight the four orders, right? So there's flexibility. Sometimes you'll see these numbers and you'll say, okay, let me try and match that. But sometimes you'll say, ooh, I've got a better idea they didn't think of and I want to use it. Well, that's okay. Go ahead and uh, change it, right? Um, so nothing sacred here. These templates are like guides. Okay. What did the item writer do? Well, indwelling urinary catheter, um, some antibiotics, uh, CT scan, some normal saline through IV, and uh, lab tests, right? Those, those were the five, and evidently three of these uh, have some urgency to them. Let's finish it off here. Uh, okay, um, so we see those same uh, orders now listed. They got, they got a tab, so the person doesn't have to remember what they were, right? They're there, um, and we can see now on the right-hand side the item. The nurse has performed the interventions as ordered by the physician for the client. For each assessment finding, click to specify if the finding indicates that the client's condition has improved, has not changed, or has declined. So in these case studies, there's a notion of before and after, right? The client, when, when, when you first uh, made your visit, the client after some interventions, and obviously, uh, you know, things, things have changed. Maybe they got better, we hope. Some might have got worse, some might have stayed the same. Okay, so I'm gonna actually click now um, to the original nurse's notes so we can see what some of the original things were. The way we would write this item when we're talking about evaluate outcomes is we want to think about data after the interventions were performed. Now, if you look carefully, the nurse's notes here, even though there's 10 o'clock and noon, these were before the interventions, right? So in other words, when I'm writing this item, an assessment finding now might be temperature of 103, right? The point is I don't need to just copy and paste the stuff from 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock. Pretend it's two o'clock or three o'clock now. What does the client look like now? Well, it's not on the left-hand side. We're just gonna be describing it over here in this table. So let's see what you can do. Um, come up with something that the client uh, might have at uh, two o'clock, three o'clock, you name it. Uh, and that would be interesting to evaluate as to whether it's better or worse 
are the same. Okay, pulse ox 95%, pulse 88, okay. These are two fantastic ones, uh, JVD and Crackles, okay. Uh, I hope JVD doesn't stand for Jason Very Dull, but other than that, I like it. Um, blood pressure 120 over 85, respirations 12, okay. Uh, increased temperature, okay, fantastic. And it could be stated that way, or a temperature could just be listed that happens to be higher than what there was before, right? Uh, decreased work in breathing, uh, decreased temperature, sure, uh, okay. Uh, and maybe it depends how much it decreased, right? Whether that's good or bad, but uh, the shortness of breath, um, and we'd probably want to describe it in a way that somebody could decide whether, whether in fact it's you know better, worse, or the same. But excellent, this group is awesome. Uh, survey says respirations of thirty six. Ah, I believe that is worse. Blood pressure one eighteen over sixty eight. I believe that is better. <laughs> you know, don't trust me, y'all. Pale skin tone, I feel like that's kind of the same-ish, but I, I may be missing some subtlety. Uh, pulse ox, 91. Uh, well, that seems the same as noon, so I guess that's stable. Uh, and then interacting with daughter at bedside. Now, I'm going to be honest, I like your work better than this item writer for one reason. Uh, as a testing professional, it's very important to me that items are very precise, so there's no ambiguity. Um, as nurses, you may see interacting with daughter at bedside, and you may know that that implies positive, healthy interactions. For me as a testing professional, the word interacting can go either way, right? The interacting could be argumentative, paranoid, right? So I would prefer uh, something more specific. To me, the word interacting has some ambiguity. So I like your choices better, um, but you get the idea. Well, congratulations. <laughs> you have made it to the end of a case study. Why do I do that exercise? Because I want to demystify these NGN items. I want to demystify our uh, cl clinical judgment measurement model, these boxes, right? So again, I have a full half day training or a half full day training, take your pick, called the action model that's all about writing from a blank piece of paper, right? But one of the great ways to come up with ideas is to look at ones we already have and put some twists, right? Or come up with your own. Uh, okay, and you can imagine, you know, how could you, how could you really make some changes? Well, you could change some things in the scenario, right? And then ask the same questions or ask different questions. Okay, well, I mentioned at the very beginning, we have two different ways to measure clinical judgment. One is through the case study, but we also, well, you saw case studies are long, right? It's a lot to read and then you have to answer six questions. We also have items, individual items, one item uh, called standalone that measure clinical judgment all by themselves. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, they may target more than one of those boxes. They usually do. I will illustrate that for you, but we have a newsletter that goes into more detail. So uh, let's see, we've got the sample uh, trend item here. And uh, so the trend is the first of our two. What is a trend item? I'm going to focus less on the content here because we're pretty contented out, if that's a word. Um, so <laughs> what is a trend item? We are presenting information at different points in time, right? I think of it as time stamped data, in this case, intake output and nurses notes, right? And then we're simply asking a question about it. And as the name suggests, well, probably there's some trend that we should have noticed or paid attention to. So uh, I mentioned that these standalone items, right? It kind of looks like a case study, but there's only one question. These standalone items nonetheless can target multiple boxes out of those six layer three boxes. Well, let's take a look. This one is asking, which of the following procedures should the nurse anticipate? Well, that probably reminds you of the generate solutions or take action type stuff that we just saw, right? Um, however, you can imagine for someone to be successful with this item, they would have had to implicitly recognize cues, analyze cues. They may have formulated hypotheses or uh, picked a particular condition that needs prioritization. So the point is they may have done the first four steps uh, in the clinical judgment measurement model to be able to answer what may here feel most like a take action. So uh, that's what I mean by these things may address multiple boxes. Let me go into the bow tie. 
This is the second of two ways we can measure clinical judgment with just a single item. So uh, here we go. I won't delve into the content deeply at all. I'll just note, again, we see a couple of tabs, kind of like an exhibit item today. On the right-hand side, we have something a little unusual you haven't seen yet. We call it a bow tie item because the place you put your answers is shaped like a bow tie. I know hardly anybody wears those anymore, um, but I think Urkel, Urkel and Young Sheldon might be uh, the last holdouts on, on bow tie, uh, but at any rate, uh, you can see kind of a little X shape. Uh, we call it a bow tie. Uh, anyways, it's a drag and drop, but there's some special structure, the bow tie structure. What does it mean? Well, it means in the middle of the bow tie where the knot would be, condition most likely experiencing, well, only the things from the middle list can go there. Actions to take, only the things on the left can go there. Uh, parameters to monitor, only the things on the right can go there. The computer won't let you put Bell's palsy into action to take. The computer guards against these things. So there's some structure, but the computer kind of helps in case anybody gets confused. I think you get the idea. Um, I mentioned checking off more than one box at layer three. Well, action to take, that sure sounds like take action. Condition most likely experiencing, that probably sounds like prioritize hypotheses. Parameter to monitor, that has a little bit of an evaluation feel. And again, to be successful, the candidate would have had to recognize cues and think about what they mean. In other words, analyze cues right? In considering actions to take, they might have thought about more things before narrowing it down, right? So maybe some generate solutions. Some of my colleagues will say that our bow tie items check off all six boxes. Sometimes I look at them and I decide five, um, but the point is multiple, right? Uh, there you go.